What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of E4 Explicit Podcast. I'm Corey, and today we have Marshall Curry, a two-time nominee, three-time, wait, four. Three nominees and then the win. Okay, so yeah, all right, yeah. Four. So four-time, you know, nominee of, uh, of the Oscars and a, uh, a one-time yeah. winner. I don't know. Actually, it's a good question, though. Does that mean three nominees and saying. one win, or yeah. is that... Yeah, that sounds that sounds, sounds more right. Yeah, yeah, like I three think. nominees and, and yeah, a one time winner. But really, the winner is like that's kind of like the the one that everybody is like because it's cool. I like how the Oscars is like one of the only things that you can do where it's like Oscar nominated director and it's still awesome as shit. It's not like just you know what I mean. But then when you get the winner hmm. on there, because yeah. now your next film is gonna say from Oscar winner uh, Marshall Curry, right? I guess. I guess. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so tell me a little bit about yourself um, and you know how you started in the film and stuff like that because you're really a documentarian, right? By yeah. trade. So, so the the short film that that we won for was um, was the first time that I'd ever written a script or worked with actors. But most the last fifteen years have been making documentary films. Yeah. Um, I got into documentary films kind of late and kind of through a circuitous route. Um, I graduated from college. I studied comparative religion in college and spent some time wandering around, lived in Mexico and Washington, D.C. and out in Indiana for a little while and then moved back to New York and got a job at an internet startup, uh, sort of internet design company and was working there for a while. And then, um, but I love documentaries. And so I really wanted to try my hand at making a documentary. No, that's cool. So what was your first doc? My first doc was Street Fight. So Damn, I met really? this was guy, first? Corey Booker, who was saying he was going to run for mayor of Newark. Um, at that point, he was just an unknown city councilman that, that you know people hadn't really heard of. But he had a kind of amazing charisma. And so um, I thought it would be an interesting movie. I bought a camera and um, read the manual and, uh, and, and, uh, and started following his campaign. And... Um, and once I finished shooting it, I tried to raise money for editing, got rejected from every grant, from every broadcaster that I sent it to. So I um, went back to the internet company, did another project, got my health insurance charged up again, and, nice. um, and then left again and spent the next year um, in my apartment just like learning how to use Final Cut Pro. I'd never, uh, I took a weekend class and kind of how it worked, but damn. but did a lot of trial and error. Seven, right? So I got seven. Yeah, well, eventually seven. At that yeah. point, it was probably like three. Yeah, or something, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, back then. Yeah. yeah. Damn, man. Yeah. That's wild. So, so Street Fight was your first doc, which was, which was good as shit. So that's why I'm like, you know, most people, so you're just a good, you can just tell a story clearly. Like you're a good storyteller because you're not knowing how to use a camera, not knowing how to edit. You would think all of those attributes are needed to, to, <laughs> to make a to movie, make a movie. Yeah, you right. know what you I mean like so. oh duh you know I have to know how to shoot press record and all that stuff right. but really you don't well you do I mean sort of I, I, I made a ton of mistakes and spent you know shot 200 hours of footage you know spent days and days and days filming stuff and 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 and, and it looked terrible you know the first <laughs> 50 hours of the footage I shot was like I was zooming in and out I, stuff was overexposed and underexposed and but you kind of get home and you look at your footage and you say like, okay, can't stop doing that. And it's kind of like learning to play an instrument. You know, you like, you can read a book about how to play a guitar, but the way you learn to play guitar is like holding a guitar and, and trying to do it over yeah. and over and over until your fingers learn it. Yeah, no, that's, that's a hundred percent. I actually tell people at, when I go to like film camp and stuff, I used to go to film camp and teach. I, t- I tell the kids like, don't even go to school. Like nowadays you could learn how to do all that stuff. <laughs> online or like you said kind of just just get your hands dirty and go in and do it so but i did read books and i did yeah. watch a ton of films and and talk to people and 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 uh so i don't want to pretend like there was no outside influence <laughs> like there was um yeah. but but i i do think um and my friends that have been to film school you know i'm sure there are things that they know that i don't know oh for sure but uh but ultimately it's about just hours behind a camera or hours sitting in a seat looking at a editing system and trying to figure out why what the thing that you've made is confusing or boring or whatever and try to keep doing it until yeah. it's not that anymore. No, that's literally what it is. Exactly. So, um, so you did street fight and then you did what? Um, so the next thing was, uh, was racing dreams. 
Um, and so that one uh, is about two boys and a girl who are 11, 12, and 13 who race go-karts that go 70 miles an hour in kind of the little league for NASCAR. And while I was shooting that, um, my, uh, my wife, who at that time was running a domestic violence organization, came home one day and said, uh, you're never going to guess what happened at work today. Four FBI agents walked into the office and arrested one of her employees and charged him with having been a domestic terrorist when he was part of a group called the Earth Liberation Front, sort of a radical environmental group. Oh, right. And so I decided to start shooting that at the same time. So I was going back and forth between, you know, Eugene, Oregon, where I was talking with, you know, people whose timber mills had been burned down and <coughs> with activists who had, you know, taken part in, in these arsons and also um, going to North Carolina to NASCAR races and um, really gave me kind of a broad view of, of uh, the, the, the tapestry of America. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So that's If a Tree Falls? So If a Tree Falls and then Racing Dreams. At yeah. the same so, time. So those were happening. I was shooting those at the same time. Then I was editing Racing Dreams. The, the day after we finished editing Racing Dreams, we started editing uh, If a Tree Falls. Damn. So, so mm -hmm. you do Street Fight. It does well. And then is that how you get the the funding? and the, you know Because it, it takes not only time, but it also takes money to yeah. do anything in film. So yep. like, is that how that works? Yeah, pretty much. So, I mean, Street Fight, I shot it uh, out of my own pocket um, and just, you know, had saved up some money from doing Internet work that I could take off time and and... Um, buy a bunch of videotapes and a bunch of, you know, and a camera and um, some microphones. And then uh, the success of that enabled me to raise the money to make Racing Dreams. If a Tree Falls was a combination of um, me fronting money, uh, we got some grants, we got, um, we had uh, one investor that put money in and we got um, pre sales. So we, once we had uh, some scenes that were edited and a pretty clear idea of how the movie was going to work, PBS and the BBC, ITVS put money in for that. So, Damn, that's crazy. And that won at Sundance, right? Yeah, it won a it won the documentary editing award. Yeah. Damn. So, yeah. And you edited it? Yeah, with with Matt Hamachek. So, uh, so he he's somebody who I worked with on um, on Racing Dreams as well. There were actually three of us editing Racing Dreams, and then Matt and I edited uh, If a Tree Falls, and um, and uh, yeah, he's a terrific editor. That's crazy, man. And then <clears throat> and then after that. Is point and shoot? Point and shoot, yep. Man, yep. first off, okay, I don't know if you remember this or not, but when you went to Tribeca, I was uh, in line, and I wasn't going to see, I had no clue who you were. I was like, uh, whatever. And then the chaos in New York, like I was telling Cooper on the way here, I was like, the only reason why we went to see point and shoot was because it was almost by accident, because it was like, you know how like Tribeca is like a couple days long, right. and it's like, it's it was kind of hard to kind of pinpoint like who you wanted to see, and I just like, point shoot sounds sounds yeah. awesome yeah. so then we bought our tickets and then we're waiting in line and we go in and that happened to be the day where you did like a and a with the the main subject right. of the film so i was like this is fucking awesome <laughs> like this is cool and then so we watch it and i'm like holy shit like this was actually like really fucking good yeah. it was a good movie and like the story was insane. I'm from Maryland. The guy's from Baltimore. Right. So it was like, it was awesome. Yeah. And then afterwards we got to meet you and meet him, ask questions. And that's where like me and you kind of like, I, I got your information. And then like, I would, I, I would hit you up actually frequently after that. And, and, you know, ask you questions and this and that, and you were super helpful. So thank you for that. No, happy for one. To. Um, but that movie was so awesome. Oh. And I think, and you, you like, you killed it at Tribeca. So was that like the, that was like the doc kind of that like whew, propelled you to do everything else or what? Well, you know, it's kind of funny that one, um, in some ways that's probably the least known of the docs. What? So street fight was nominated for an Oscar. If a tree falls was nominated for an Oscar <laughs> racing dreams, one best doc at Tribeca and, and then point and shoot one best doc at Tribeca. So, um, but, but of all of them, uh, I think probably point and shoot might be the least known. Of what? Yeah, yeah. And that wasn't nominated. Uh, is it it was not. No. Did you even, in, uh, did you even enter it? Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, if you play for a week in New York in theaters in New York or LA, it basically qualifies. So you just fill out some paperwork and, and That's submit it? it. So yeah. Yeah. So oh, yeah. So shit. a lot of movies, uh, a lot of movies qualify each year. Wow. It's just a matter of actually just doing the paperwork and getting it submitted. Yeah, well the paperwork's not the hard part. The hard part is getting 
getting selected, selected. Oh, okay. making yeah. the movie. So, so hundreds of movies. Yeah, so hundreds of movies qualify. And then the documentary branch of the Academy, um, the members of that branch vote. You know, they have a list of all the movies that qualified and they vote <laughs> and pick a short list, which is like 12 to 15 movies usually each year. And then from that short list, they vote again to pick the five nominees. And then the Damn. whole Academy votes on the winner. The winner. Yeah. Holy shit. I did not know that that's how that worked. Yeah. And then obviously since you were nominated for Street Fight for If a Tree Falls and um, Racing Dreams. like Not Racing Dreams. Race, no, so no, not Racing Dreams. That one for... Uh, for Tribeca. For Tribeca, yeah. yeah. But they yeah. already kind of like knew your name and they knew like your work and how good everything was and then that kind of propelled anything. or how You know what I mean? Or is it yeah. just like... You're just like you mean in the Academy? Yeah, you know. I mean, it's hard to say. Like, I'm sure that having people know your work and like you is, is helpful. Yeah. Um, but also there's sometimes a sense of like wanting to spread the love around. And, you know, if you've gotten to go there a couple of times, maybe somebody else should get a shot. So, yeah. um, but, uh, Tell yeah, I mean, video. I think the truth is that most people that are, that are in the Academy just vote for stuff that they like. They like, yeah. yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of how most people vote. And you, and so you won for this for, um, best live action doc short live action short. Yeah. So that's the, the one. So last year, I made a short doc that's called A Night at the Garden. Bro. It's a seven-minute film about a Nazi rally that filled Madison Square Garden in 1939. So it's the shortest, and it was nominated. So that, that was the sh in, in the doc short category. So it was the shortest film in 50 years that had been nominated, somebody told me. What? Because um, it's only seven minutes, the whole movie. Um, and, uh, and so that got nominated last year. And then this year, uh, we, we put out... Um, uh, the neighbor's window, which was the first time that I'd written the script or worked yeah. with actors. Yeah, no. So, um, before I talk about that one, which was fucking awesome, the that blew my mind. That the Nazi, uh, yeah. When I, when I saw you promoting that, I'm like, what is this? Is he yeah. like just like, is this like found footage? Like what? And then it's like a legit thing that happened that I I know my listeners probably have no clue. Yeah, I didn't happened. know about it either. You yeah. didn't know about it? Either? No, no. I'm, I I have a friend who's a screenwriter. And uh, we were at lunch and he told me about, he's, he, he's writing a screenplay that takes place in New York in 1939. And he said, he was doing this research and he said, did you know that there was a Nazi rally that <laughs> filled Madison Square Garden? Wow. And I thought, oh, come on, I would have known about this. And so I went home that night and looked and sure enough, there was. And, and also there were some short clips, video clips from it in some historical documentaries. And so I thought, well, if there's a couple of seconds of this thing, there's got to be more. Like nobody... Yeah. Nobody films the thing and just shoots a few seconds of it. So, um, so I got a guy, Rich Remsberg, who's a great archival researcher, to start looking around. And, um, and he was able to find footage in um, the National Archive and UCLA's archive and Grinberg archive. And there were pieces of it in lots of different places. Wow. But some of it, like stuff that the National Archive had, they had film that had literally never been scanned high def before. And so we paid the lab fees to get them to scan the stuff and, and gathered all the footage that we could find. And, um, and at first I thought I would do kind of a traditional historical documentary where you have a historian explain yeah, the interviews, and, interviews stuff. and stuff. And then one day I, I just kind of on a whim decided, what would this feel like if it were edited like, um, like Racing Dreams or like you know a Verite movie where mm -hmm. you're just watching stuff happen. You just drop the audience into this rally without explaining what it is what would happen? What, how would that feel? And so I just edited that. And, um, and when I finished, I thought, yeah, there's something cool here. It makes you kind of lean in and ask all these questions that, that maybe, uh, you wouldn't ask as, as, uh, sort of intensely if, uh, if, if it had been all laid out for you in advance. That's exactly what I did when I watched it. I was like, what the fuck is this? And then I was just like asking myself questions over and over. I'm like, why is Hitler or why are these Nazis? In New York at MSG right yeah. now. Yeah, and there's you know a 30 foot portrait of George Washington yeah. and swastikas, yes. and there are American flags, and they're singing the Star Spangled Banner and saying the Pledge of Allegiance, and then, you know, saying let's take America back from the minorities who are destroying it, and let's, uh, you know, attacking the press, and yeah. <coughs> um, a protester runs out on stage, and they beat him up, and the crowd just sort of laughs and cheers, and no, that was wild, yeah. and that happened literally in America and then you know six years later or five years later you know all that shit happened so yeah. like that's just 
maybe why why do you think no one knew about that because it's the nazis in new york yeah i think it's pretty <laughs> embarrassing part of our history yeah. you know it's like i think we would like to imagine that when the nazis rose up and anti-semitism was you know getting tossed around that everybody in america instantly knew how horrible it was but the truth is you know if 20,000 people show up at a rally you got to know a lot more people than that supported it but weren't there and we know that there were you know there were people on the radio father coughlin had a radio show where it reached 30 million homes 30 million americans where he would say good things about Mussolini and Hitler and what? and and you know Charles Lindbergh and Henry Ford and a lot of these you know legitimate mainstream le- business leaders social leaders were were pretty clear about their anti-semitism and 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 you know white supremacist views and so um I think once World War II started and suddenly Nazi soldiers are killing Americans, suddenly everybody pretends like yeah. nobody in America ever supported this. This is we're we're way better than that. But the truth is, you know, we make mistakes. Like we are vulnerable to demagogues who can whip us up against each other. And and Americans are like a lot of people around the world that that we can have hatred stirred up and we can have anti you know, anti-Semitic, anti-Muslim, anti-Mexican views uh, stirred up by leaders who, who want to set us against each other. No, literally, you're, that's happens all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that was found footage film. Now that was kind of, is that kind of like your, uh, your niche? Cause I know the, um, I know you shot If a Tree Falls and then the, the, yep. the, the, the street fight, but point and shoot was like what 800 hours of just footage from him traveling yeah, i don't know about 800 but it was a lot of footage yeah. um but yeah so he he had a ton of footage um and then i did probably 20 something hours of interviews with him um and then edited that all together into into making the movie man do you ever like because i know because when i edit stuff if i haven't shot it I kind of sometimes don't look like at every clip all yeah. the way through. I yeah. just like, oh, that sounded good, and right. it could be like two minutes in, right. even though there might be like a golden nugget. Yeah, eight minutes in. Well, somebody in the office looked at everything, uh. <laughs> so it wasn't necessarily me. But um, all right, that makes sense. But uh, but yeah, you know, he would also just like set his GoPro on while he's riding his motorcycle and just like ride for an hour. Yeah. So you kind of you don't need to. Watch, watch an hour. all of that yeah, in yeah. real time anyway. But but we did skip through, you know, we watched it. Somebody watched everything at the very least high speed and wow. um, just to, you know, make sure that there wasn't some great yeah, nugget. Exactly. And sometimes those little nuggets, you know, just pop up somewhere and, yeah. and you can build a, beat, a scene out of them. No, that's true. Yeah, exactly. And then so let's talk about the, the new film. That so This is your first time writing a script, dealing with actors, you know, like a, a legit like full blown <laughs> production crew and all that stuff. You shot it all in one location in the in, yep. the, in the city. Yep, uh, in Brooklyn actually. So in the apartment building where I live. <coughs> so it's not shot in my personal apartment, but it was in our building in, in a very generous friend's apartment. That's and the cool. the conceit of the movie is that a neighbor, uh, sort of a mother of young kids, um, who's maybe in her late thirties, early forties, uh, has a young twenty something couple who moves in across the street, and they're sort of living the life that 20 somethings live. And she develops this rear window style obsession with watching them. And so we needed uh, two apartments that actually looked at each other. I, I, I didn't want to try to fake that. So, um, so we got one apartment and then I introduced myself to the uh, neighbors across the street. We had some mutual friends who helped with that introduction and said, can we just shoot in your apartment as well for a little while? And they, they were very generous also. Wow. That's clutch. Yeah, it was lucky. Especially in New York. Yeah. Me. And no, I had to really get permits lucky. and yeah. all that jazz right. yeah. and paying out the ass for stuff. Oh, right. my God. That's cool. Yeah. And the, and because I, I was going to ask you, like, it didn't look like you faked it. So you literally right. had to find Two an apartments. adjacent. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, because there's scenes where, you know, somebody's in the kitchen and somebody's setting the table and there's the window and then you see the other yeah. window. So, so it, you, you, I think you would have felt it if, it if it wasn't real. Yeah. No, that I, I was... When we were watching it, it was like, it was 20, 21 minutes long. And I'm like, how are you going to tell us? You know, but then I saw you tell the, the Nazi one in seven. So I'm like, <laughs> if he's got 21, it's like, you know. It's like three times yeah. as long. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like three times as long. I was blown away. I was like, I was like, I wanted to cry. I was happy. I, it, it like ran the gamma of Aww. like, you know, all the emotions as it should. Oh, and I cool. was just like, it was fucking awesome. 
We were we watched it on the way here, on yeah. the drive here, yeah. sitting on the BQE, just nice. like <laughs> watching your movie, and it was like. Hope I hope the driver wasn't wasn't. Uh... I was the driver. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, we were in traffic, so it was kind of <laughs> like, you know. but it was awesome. It was so good. It was shot. Amazing. The actors, actors are great. Where'd you find them? So like, the 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 DP was uh, is Wolfgang Held. He is somebody who actually shot with me on Racing Dreams and cool. and uh, shoots a lot of amazing docs and also shoots fiction. And so he and I were shooting it uh, uh, away on a shoot, and I told him this idea I had, and he liked it. And so um so he was great partner on it. Um, all of the pre production work of figuring out all the camera angles and all the setups and the blocking and stuff. He was, he was, he really kind of held my hand through all that because yeah. he knew how to do that in a way that I didn't. Um, and then the actors were, were really terrific too. The lead actress is uh, Maria Dizia, who's been on Orange is the New Black and some Noah Baumbach movies and 13 Reasons Why. She's a largely, a, she does a lot of theater also. So she's been nominated for Tony in New York. And, um, but she and I actually, um, well, back up. I grew up in New Jersey, went to public school in New Jersey, but there was a, a private girls' school in our town that uh, needed guys to be in their plays. Um, and so, uh, so when I was in the tenth grade, they did hair, and I was kind of a hippie in the tenth grade. And my mother wanted to, you know, channel my hippiness to yeah. something productive, so she was like, "Maybe you should try out for hair." <laughs> and I thought, "Okay," so I went and I did that. Nailed it. And uh, and and um, really liked being in that. Got a lead role and became close with the director. Um, and so he encouraged me to, to be in some more plays. So we did Romeo and Juliet. We did Equus. We did, um, uh, we did this sort of weird experimental play where, where, where there are apes that spoke in verse that Peter <laughs> Dinklage was in with me actually. What? So, yeah. So he went to school, he went to a private boys school in right in the town next to us. So, so he was also recruited by this girl school to, to be in the play. So. Um, anyway, it, I, I stayed friends with the director. The director was one of these teachers. You maybe you had one in high school who just sort of like changed your life oh, and for sure. pointed yeah. you in the right direction. Yeah. And so that's what this guy was for me. And, um, and so we stayed friends, you know, as, as I became an adult and when gay marriage was finally legalized in New York, he married the guy that he'd been with all the way since I oh, knew wow. him. And, um, and at his wedding, uh, I sat next to Maria Dizia, who was a student at that school as well. And she was about five years younger than I was, but um, so we didn't really know each other then. But mm -hmm. um, but she had uh, she um, I, I knew her work, and about that time I was writing the script. And so when I finished it, I asked her <coughs> if she'd take a look at it and consider possibly being in it. And she very generously uh, uh, read it and said, "Sure, she would do it." So we shot it in four days. Damn! You trying to, what? Oh, yeah. Where did the husband come from? He was fucking hilarious. He's great too. Yeah, Greg Keller. He. Um, what's funny about him is I was watching reels from lots of different actors trying to find it, and I just couldn't quite find the person. And um, and I started thinking like, well, maybe the guy that I have in my head like doesn't exist. Maybe I need to start adjusting my, sure. you know, and and thinking about it in a different way. And right about that time, a friend of mine who. Um, uh, who does a lot of theater stuff in New York said like, have you ever considered Greg Keller? And I hadn't heard of him, but he sent me his reel and I watched it. And I was like, that That's it. is him. Like it is, he's like charming and lovable and frustrating and just like exactly who I wanted. So I cast him. And after I cast him, I found out that he and Maria Dizia had played husband and wife in plays before before that. What? And so they walked onto the set the first day and just like snapped into it. Like they just, it was as if they were old married couple. That, yeah, because like, the chemistry in the, in the, in the film was like, yeah. I thought they were like, these guys got to be married in yeah, real life. Right. Like they were fantastic They're terrific. together. They're terrific. They're both so good. How yeah. funny is that? And she never was like, oh, she never like brought him up to you either. No, but I mean, uh, that wasn't. That's just how know, it works. Yeah. I wasn't asking her like, do you have yeah, any yeah, ideas? Of course. But, yeah. You're not going to ask her, hey, do you got a, yeah. another actor, buddy? Yeah. 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 <laughs> no one does that. Right. That's cool as shit. That's yeah. awesome. And the kids, were they yours? The kids were not mine. Oh. Um, <clears throat> we had a casting director go out and find the kids, um, but they were terrific too. They're really twins. Um, oh, really? Yeah, so they are brother and sister. And um, and a lot of the lines that they <coughs> are saying were, um, were written, but there are some where um, we started shooting some of the scenes with a little documentary feel. So like where they're making the Valentines and... <coughs> excuse me. Like the montages? Yeah. Um, that... We sort of let them 
just do what they were doing and, and filmed it as if we were shooting a documentary and I was standing behind Maria so that their eye line would be correct and talking to them. And, but so some of the sort of funnier quirky lines were, were things that, um, that they just were saying to each other as they were working. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Working with kids, man. Yeah, it's tricky. Never, it is tricky. Yeah. And, but fun. Yeah. So it was a four day shoot. Would you guys like shoot it on? Like, was it was it all union stuff? Because um, I'm sure. Yeah. So we had, you know, the they're all SAG. So that was we that was all um, that was all in the union. And then, um, we shot it. Uh, um, our DP uh, is part of a collective that um, of of other cinematographers, and they own some gear. So they were super generous. I mean, everybody everybody worked for ten percent of their normal rate. Sure. Gave us equipment for you know, a fraction of what it would go for in a, in a normal shoot. And so, um, so, uh, so we shot it on, um, an Alexa mini that was on a, on a, um, a movie for the tracking shots, you know, so yep. that they sort of move around and then, um, uh, an Amira, um, for, uh, for some of the other shots. So, nice. um, so it looked great. I was super Let's happy see. with, uh, with, with how that all turned out. Yeah. The cinematography was great in it. It was, the audio was money. It, yep. Cause the only reason I asked is because like the, you know, if the unions evolved and all that stuff, like, does that, you know, help the qualifications or whatever? Like, but you were saying it's kind of like, if you just run the circuit of how, how did you get to qualify this since you're so used to, you know, documentaries being qualified, yep. you know, the process of that. Yeah. So, I mean, all these qualification rules are just online. If you just go to the yeah. Academy website, it'll tell you how different things qualify. But for, for live action short, um, it either needs to play for a week in a theater or it needs to win an award at one of 30 different top festivals. Wow. So we won some awards and also played in the theater. So, so, um, so it sort of actually turned out to qualify in a couple of different ways, but Damn. that's cool. And then, all right. And then of course, so you go to the Oscars. I remember you, I remember you said something the f about the March of the Penguins, like the first time yeah. you went to the Oscars, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So that was when, so when street fight was nominated, <laughs> okay. which I feel remember that's the movie that I shot with, you know, a little camera on yeah. my home. And that was the same year that March of the Penguins was nominated, cleaned up, which had, which had made more money than any movie up for best picture that year. So, uh, so it was just kind of like, I don't think any of the other films, <laughs> any other docs like made a, you know, even like, prepared a speech, you know, yeah. it was just like, well, we know what's going to happen here. Um, but what's kind of hilarious, if you see, there's a picture right over there that you see that one right there. Yeah. The penguin. Um, that is, um, uh, so the guys from March of the Penguins brought these stuffed penguins to the Oscars that year. And, uh, and so uh, at the moment where they get called, um, we're all sitting together. They get up to go on stage and there's a, there's a, uh, one of my friends did a screen grab of the television and then printed it out and gave it to me. But there's this shot of me kind of going like this as one of these guys hits me in the head with his stuffed penguin going up on stage. So, so. it's kind of like a subliminal like. yeah 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 so i was just <laughs> like so and take that yeah it goes up to, to that's take so the Oscar. funny damn man yeah they, they i remember that that yeah. year that's so funny that I, I literally watched that and like you were like right there yeah that's so cool and then all right so take me to the night that you won wow. oh it was really fun i mean you know we um we had a good group of people there uh maria was there and um and wolfgang was there and um and we had our producers. <coughs> My wife, who produces a lot of stuff with me, um, was also there. And um, that story was actually inspired by a podcast that I had heard years ago. Um, so a, a woman told a true story um, uh, um, on Love and Radio, the podcast Love and Radio. She told this story about having a young couple move in across the street from her and, and, and becoming obsessed with watching them. So she'd been really nice about the fact that the movie was getting made and being yeah. generous about it with her story. Uh, so we were able to actually get a ticket for her to come with us to the Oscars. That's cool. So that was fun to have her there too. Um, and, uh, and Ben who works with me was there. So it was a good, we had a good group of people um, at the, uh, at the, the show. Um, you know, we were pretty early in the show, which is nice cause you don't have to worry too much. You get it out of the way. And, <laughs> um, and it finally, uh, yeah, they, they, uh, one funny little quirk is that the, the documentaries, and also live action shorts are pretty low on the totem pole of, sure. of, of social hierarchy at the, yeah. at the Oscars. So we get stuck in the back of the room and then right before in the commercial break, before they're going to call your category, they move us up front so we don't have to w walk so far to get up on stage. Wow. 
So, um, so they moved us up and, uh, and, um, yeah, I was, I was nervous. Um, but I'd been there three times before and hadn't won. So I thought probably that's what's going to happen again. And, and then they called it out and it was, uh, it was really, it was really exciting. Uh, yeah. So the, um, it's so funny. I was in, we were in Detroit filming and I was like, Oh man, I want to watch the Oscars tonight. Cause it's kind of, it's really nostalgic for me at this point. Cause I know I'm never going to, you know, probably go there. So you you never know, but you know, I kind of, I kind of, that ship has sailed for me because I just had a bad experience in New York. So anyways, I was in Detroit filming and then I, I get to the, we get to the hotel and I'm like, let me turn the Oscars on. And then literally, that's why I didn't even know that you won because right when I turned it on, it was the commercial break after Shia LaBeouf and, uh, right. uh, what's his name? Called you up right. and you gave your speech. And I'm like, I'm like, Oh, you know, I wonder if, I wonder if Marshall's in there this time, whatever. And then the next day you posted that picture of the Oscar. And I was like, get the fuck oh, out of here. Fun. Yeah. So then that's when I like, so I was like, I emailed you, I messaged you and I, I texted you. Cause I was like, you know, cause that's awesome. Yeah. Like I've never known anyone that's done. Cause that to me, like, that's like the pinnacle yeah. of, of filmmaking, honestly, you know what I mean? So, and the fact that you did it in 21 minutes and you did it in a fiction, you know, when you're so used to, Docs. Docs, man. Yeah. It's just like. Well, I love docs. Uh, I, you know, I think that probably a lot of people see them very differently, but really it's just making movies. You know, some of them are fiction and some are nonfiction, but the grammar of it all is, is remarkably similar. Yeah, you're right. So, so what would you tell someone who's, you know, kind of, you know, either not into this or falling into it or interested in filmmaking and, and that kind of stuff. Someone who you've, you've pretty much done everything at this point now and you've kind of, wow. You know, I mean like as far as, uh, you know, shot stuff on your own, you've mm-hmm. worked with actors, you've, you've kind of, you've worked with all kinds of people at a higher level, lower level and, and everything in between. So, and you've won an Oscar, you've been nominated multiple times. You've run the, f- the, the, um, the film festival circuit. You've done a lot of stuff. So what would you tell, you know, what would you tell, you know, 15 or 20 year old Marshall. Yeah. I mean, I just say, try it. If you want to do it, try it. Like life is short. And, and if you got something you want to do, whether it's make movies or do podcasts or design hats or invest stocks or whatever it is you want to do, don't wait, you know, give it a try and and find out because you don't want to be 95 on your deathbed and look back and think, ah, I wish I tried that thing if I wasn't so scared, you know? No, definitely. But, and, and, and they don't all work out. Like I've had a lot of stuff that I've tried that didn't work out. So trying it isn't necessarily uh, 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 a promise that it's going to go the way you want, but you learn something, you know, you, you, you grow from it and you don't have to worry about the fact that you never tried. Like then you find out. Um, yeah. So, you know, cameras are so cheap now. Uh, editing equipment is so cheap now. Great looking stuff. You know, the my phone shoots a much better image than the camera that I shot Street Fight on. And and stuff can be on television and in, you know, playing in huge movie theaters blown up on giant screens and it looks amazing. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, I watch a lot of films. I read about films. I, 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 I think about them a lot. But there's nothing like spending hours and hours shooting and then sitting in a room trying to edit it into something to teach you how to how to how to do it that's awesome that's good advice man well thank you so much for having us thank you man I it's great it. to talk with you i know man it's good it's really to finally fun. meet you in person i know i know i've been so, following you for a while so yeah, appreciate thanks. that I appreciate it that's it for e for explicit podcast we'll see you next time